welcome to our our class on Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's Yichon Olivracha. At some point in these preparations, I began to feel the presence of Heschel in my midst. And what that means for me is that he heightened my sense of awareness at the radical amazement of just being alive. What it meant was I felt increasingly proud of our community for doing its work this week to house and feed the homeless. What it meant was I felt close to Israel and feel close to Israel, especially today. What it meant was that I studied the Torah from the inside and not the outside. And most importantly for me was in my preparations for this class, Heschel challenged me in my theology. And so tonight, I felt as our introduction for the evening, um, we are going to put the readings of the Sabbath aside until next week for discussion. And we're going to focus on Heschel's theology, specifically God in search of man. So I made a second set of texts for you this, I feel, is really an essential way to start any class on Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, because what Heschel taught us was that to connect with God, one needs to connect with the world, the grandeur of the mystery of the world, of the natural world around us, as a way to connect with God. Secondly, through the Torah through the Hebrew Bible, which he made so prescient and relevant to our times, and third, through action. And so it was through all these ways that I mentioned that I felt Heschel calling me, go deeper, connect more, give. And really, this is all coming from a very deep and very ancient and very close and intimate relationship with God. Heschel came from a lineage of Rebbes. Um, really, the Hasidic Rebbes that we all know and love, the Baal Shem Tov, are all his great great grandparents, literally. Um, he was descended from um, the Rebbe, specifically named after Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel of Apt, the Rebbe of Apt. And he, from the age of three, was seen as a Rebbe himself. We don't necessarily see him that because we that way now because we saw him take on the role of professor, philosopher, educator in universities, um, rabbinic seminaries, albeit, but he was less a rebbe and more a professor in his role. That was simply, really, because of the Shoah, because of the Holocaust. He was taken out of. Um, of his Hasidic lineage and where he, who knows, would have um, helped bridge modernity with the Hasidic yeshiva in Europe because of Hitler and brought, thankfully, to America where he was safe. His family, however, was murdered in the, in the Holocaust, his mother, his sisters. And yet he was never, never brought down spiritually because of this. And one can only imagine how that is possible. Um, we see it, though, in our own midst. We see our beloved Al um, still lit up in his soul. And um, Heschel as well, Susanna writes, never thought of himself or his family. Well, obviously his family were victims, but he never thought of himself and never wanted Jews to perpetuate the notion of victimhood. He was truly a man that um, helped Lift, lift up what had fallen, whether it was hearts, souls, people, the Torah itself, God, to lift up, to raise up into a light, into a place that was higher, where certainly Heschel dwelled. So I'm gonna move on now, and I would love to hear from you other goals you might have specifically for our course, and you can email me or, or share during the break. I'd like to uh, start with, or continue with, a quote. Um, this is a telegram that Heschel wrote, and you'll see why I'm sharing it 
looking at Eugene. It ends with the title of our class. To President John F. Kennedy, the White House, June 16, 1963. I look forward to privilege of being present at meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. Likelihood exists that Negro problem will be like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Please demand of religious leaders personal involvement, not just solemn declaration. We forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate Negroes. Church synagogues have failed. They must repent. Ask of religious leaders to call for national repentance and personal sacrifice. Let religious leaders donate one month's salary toward fund for Negro housing and education. I propose that you, Mr. President, declare state of moral emergency. A Marshall Plan for aid to Negroes is becoming a necessity. The hour calls for high moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. Abraham Joshua Heschel, 1963. Now what's interesting is that he didn't become a, a big social activist until later in his life. You can imagine post-Holocaust, you know, you might expect him reflecting on the Holocaust, you know, grieving and stuck, but his earlier writings were, were philosophy of Judaism, were prayer, practice, worship, um, building our spirituality and our relationship with Torah, um, the heavenly Torah being one of the texts we'll, we'll look at today as well, his helping us to connect to um, the Agadic texts, the Midrashic texts, the poetry of, of the Torah, as well as the Halachic texts that um, he and his family lived by, but showing us those white spaces in between that we, um, in between the black letters of the Torah. So he so he wrote about all those um, pieces, and then in the in you, you know in the time when um, social social justice became so prescient around him, he um, he called on his wisdom, the wisdom of the prophets, to become an activist, and. Um, Increasingly so, and he was always um, aware of social justice, but really a, a, a strong activist and a visible one as well later in his life. So um, I'd like now to move on to a brief um, review of Heschel's biography. Um, you were given this in your handouts. I should say I hope and intend for all of your goals to be fulfilled, those spoken and not spoken, um, for this course. And I'm moved by them, actually. I, I am glad to have heard your personal reasons for being in the class, um, Pamela and Sue Ellen and Jean and Norma and those who shared. Thank you. Heschel was born in 1907. He was born in Warsaw into seven generations of Hasidic masters. I spoke um, about the Opter Rebbe, after who Heschel was named. His father was Moshe Mordechai and his mother Rivka Rezel. You remember on Yom Kippur, I'm gonna embarrass you again, Jerry. I, I told the story of Jerry's mother and how she learned from her actions. Do you remember that story, those of you who were there? It was her actions, her way of being, her way of moving on in her life that Jerry learned from and was able to then teach her daughter. So wondering how Heschel got, who was asking, was it Bob? How did he get to be who he was? And I wonder this too. Um, how did he get his inspiration and his brilliance and his, you know, what really was this background of Heschel? So this is volume one of his biography um, by Edward Kaplan. And I'm going to read two, um, two short quotes about the Opta Rebbe, his uh, more ancient um, ancestor, and then about his own dad. Heschel's dad told a story, told one of his father's stories about their ancestor, the Opta Rav. He, he was asked by many other Rebbes, why are your prayers always accepted and not ours? He gave the following answer. You see, Whenever a Jew comes to me and pours out his heart and tells me of his, miser of his misery and suffering, I have such compassion that a little hole is created in my heart. Since I have heard and listened to a great many Jews with their problems and anguish, there are a great many holes in my heart. I'm an old Jew and when I start to pray, I take my heart and I place it before God. God sees this broken heart, so many holes, so many splits, and God has compassion for my heart 
And that's why God listens. God listens to my prayers. Heschel's father's actions. At the end of every day, any tzedakah that was left, any money, any loose change that was left in this impoverished family uh, home, they ate, the min they ate the minimal. On Shabbat, they ate sardines. They didn't eat the carp and the good fish, even on Shabbat. They, they ate modestly because any penny left over, I don't know, I guess it wouldn't be penny, it would be, thank you. Any kopeck that was left, he would give to tzedakah, and they would give to tzedakah that very night. They would not be left with any leftover money in their home. They would give it away to tzedakah. And so his father would find no rest when any woman, for example, would burst into the prayer house, falling in front of the ark, opening the doors and weeping and wailing, grabbing the Torah scrolls, begging mercy for her desperately ill husband or sick child, sometimes for a mother of children who is on the verge of leaving, the, leaving this world. And Heschel's father, it is written here, according to Heschel, could find no rest. Quickly, he slipped out of his private room, discreetly entered the living room, sat down on the ottoman under, under the large photograph of the old Shorkover Rebbe handing, hanging there, and slowly recovered his composure. So these are people who deeply, deeply felt the pain and suffering of the people around them. And that deep compassion of the person, of the human heart, was passed down through the generations of these Hasidic Rebbes. And that combined with the writings of our Torah, of particularly the prophets, um, but not just the prophets, also rabbinic texts that, and Kabbalistic texts that talk about Shekhinah going into exile with us and suffering along with us, these were the texts by which they lived. God is with us in our exile, and so we must rejoice. You know, this is, this is Hasidut in real life form. This is, these are the old Hasidic Rebbes who, um, who can continue to inspire us today. <coughs> Continuing on with the biography, um, Heschel had already been identified as an ilui, a genius, at the age of six. He had mastered Talmudic and Hasidic texts by the time he was a teenager. A big event in Heschel's life, as you can imagine, in how he would watch and love and adore his father, was the sudden death of his father at the age of 10, of, of Heschel's age of 10. In, in 1916, um, Heschel was devastated and said, what, said to Susanna, if I could only have another hour to talk to my dad. Um, by the age of 15, Heschel began to be interested in art and poetry and other literature and eventually Western philosophy um, outside of the Hasidic world. And he would visit the Warsaw neighborhoods and speak with philosophers and poets. And he insisted at the age of 16 to go to a modern Jewish high school in Vilna, Lithuania, where many of the fellow students were not observant. So this, you know, he is at the time, the exact time, the onset of modernity when Jews were no longer just in the shtetl, insulated and living a pious Jewish life, but there became options, right? We, we like to say, you know, um, everyone, everyone nowadays is a Jew by choice because of all the options around us. Um, Heschel lived at the time when Judaism became a choice, and he maintained his observance all the way through, um, but he began to be influenced by, um, by Western thought and philosophy around him. He became a great philosopher. He became an expert in all of Western philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, and on from there, and built bridges for those who studied medieval philosophy, Maimonides. He wrote a book on Maimonides, um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, I think. So um, Heschel moved to Berlin, where he um, studied philosophy and received a PhD in prophetic consciousness. Um, he was uh, forced out of Germany by the Nazis in 1938, just before Kristallnacht, which we just observed last week. Um, he returned to Warsaw and began to apply for overseas positions to get out of Europe. Thankfully, um, just six weeks before the Nazi invasion of Warsaw, he was able to get out and he was invited um, by the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, the Reform Se uh, Rabbinic Seminary, um, to be a professor there. 
and Morgenstern was known as the man who, who saved Heschel and others, um, other academics, um, really just, just in time. Heschel speaks of himself as um, the brand who, who survived the, let me read this quote, who survived the, uh, the Holocaust. You have this quote in your, in your text. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's in the text that I sent you, which is the chapter from Kaplan's book on Heschel. I don't know if you brought that with you or not. Um, but he says, I am a brand plucked from the fire in which my people was burned to death. I am a brand plucked from the fire of an altar to Satan on which millions of human lives were exterminated to evil's greater glory. Susanna writes that he never went back to Europe. He wrote, if I should go to Poland or Germany, every stone, every tree would remind me of contempt, of hatred, of murder, of children killed, of mothers burned alive, of human beings asphyxiated. So in 1940, Heschel began his life again. He um, began to uh, teach at HUC, and, and in 1945, he met Sylvia Strauss, his wife. Um, she's a concert pianist. They were married in 1946. They moved, to ne they moved to New York City. You can imagine what it was like for Heschel to teach at a reform rabbinic seminary in Ohio, <laughs> coming from the world that he came from. It was difficult for him to say the least, and he never really fit in anywhere in America. Um, I was thinking today how he's a perfect Rebbe for Har Shalom, because <laughs> all the denominations he spoke to, um, he, he, he had an answer for the reform movement, he had questions for the conservative movement, he challenged and, um, and, um, and spoke to each one um, where they were. Uh, but he didn't really belong, of course, to any one of them. And there are others um, like him who are sort of in between worlds um, that we see still. You know, people who, um, I, I think Svi, Rabbi Svi would be one of them as well, who were raised in an Orthodox world and don't quite fit in there and find their place and make their place for themselves in, um, in places and spaces where their wisdom can be, can be heard and received. So, um, Heschel tried in New York City to fit in in a better, uh, in a little bit more traditional setting in the conservative movement. And um, students talk about how he would walk into the classroom and he would say, oh my god, I saw a miracle today. And they'd say, what was it, Rabbi Heschel? I saw the sun rise. His radical amazement was an inspiration to an entire generation of conservative rabbis. Um, Victor Gross, Rabbi Victor Gross is one of them in Boulder, who studied with Heschel. <clears throat> On the note of the sunrise, he also talks about how he said, this for me is just as personal as it is for you, this trying to maintain our deep and important connection to God who is in search of us as much as we are in search of God. And he would say to people, I remember a time walking home from class in Berlin and I noticed the sunset as I was reading my books and walking and you know, I was always studying and I looked up and I saw the sunset and I thought, oh my God, I almost missed this sunset. He'd, al he had al he had almost missed um, Davini Mari and, and blessing God for the sunset. And to him, that just brought him directly back to what was most important, which was that cultivation of radical amazement and awe that leads to faith, that leads to action. Um, and without that, our learning is idolatrous. And um, so let us say that I hope in all our learning together, it will inspire us to, to righteous action and to moments of noticing God's presence in our midst. Um, in 1952, Heschel published God in Search of Man, which is really his, his uh, philosophy of Judaism from which we'll study tonight. Um, in the 60s, as I mentioned, he became very involved in political causes. He was the first to talk about the plight of Soviet Jews. He was an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War. He was active in civil rights. He writes and, and then speaks in our clip that we'll see, um, in a free society, some are guilty, all are responsible. 
he spoke of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as one of the true great men of our age, a truly great prophet. After marching alongside King in Selma, Alabama in 1965, Heschel said, as Bob said tonight, with every step he felt as if his legs were praying, praying for a better future for all humankind. December 23rd, 1972, 40 years ago, this next month, Heschel died peacefully in his sleep on Shabbat. And those who die on Shabbat are known to be tzaddikim. By his bed, there was an old book of Hasidic teachings right next to a new book about the Vietnam War. Susanna writes, politics and social problems were his major concern, and what gave his politics such strength was the religious insight he brought to bear on them. For him, politics and theology were always intertwined. He, read, he wrote, to speak about God and remain silent on Vietnam is blasphemous. She writes, my father was a unique combination of a Hasidic voice of compassion and mercy, always seeing the goodness in other people, and a prophetic voice of justice, denouncing hypocrisy, self-centeredness, and indifference. My father wasn't interested in assigning blame or claiming victimhood, but as the Bible does, he showed us a vision of who we might become. He was a voice of inspiration, not argumentation, rooted in Jewish religious thought. What he once wrote of East European Jews applied to him as well. Jewishness was not in the fruit, but in the sap that stirred through the tissues of the tree. Bred in the silence of the soil, it ascended to the leaves to become eloquent in the fruit. So too, Jewishness infused my father like the sap of a tree, and his eloquence was the fruit of his deep Jewish piety and learning. Rabbi Ben and I spent an evening with Susanna Heschel at Riverside Church, where it was the anniversary of, what was it? Right. It was the anniversary of his speech against the Vietnam War, and we um, were in the, sa in the same place. It was, in the, it was at Riverside Church in New York City um, that he had given that speech that he raised Susanna um, in the Upper West Side of New York City, and, he, um, and she spoke so powerfully about her father, and I'll, I'll never forget her almost screaming the words. For my father, the Torah was not just about compassion. It was not just about goodness and generosity. The Torah is about justice. And she said, justice, justice shall you pursue. This is the essential teaching of our Torah, according to my father. I wish we could have a whole class just imagining what Heschel would say today. <laughs> um, it might be a tough conversation to have, but it would be an important one, and he would want us to have it um, with deep respect for the other in the process. Any, any comments so far, questions, ruminations? I was going to comment that um, at 16 he went to this to a modern Jewish school. And so maybe you give credit to his mother for letting him go because his father wasn't alive anymore. Yeah. Um, but isn't that unusual that somebody who comes from that kind of background would be allowed to go to um, To a school um, where not everybody was observant. Yeah. That's a, re I mean, that really, that decision opened up this entire right. world for him. So I can imagine the pressure was on not just her from Heschel, but around her, the other families. And I mean, I know what it's like to try to figure out where to send your kid to school and what influences they're going to have. And she, you know, I'm sure really, really struggled with this and probably said, your father would kill me, <laughs> but go. <laughs> just go, Heschel. I don't know. It is. It's amazing. You're right. Yes. When I read that, I thought it was uh, perhaps 
his love of the poetry and, and the arts and such that he went to, and that's where he wanted to go. And uh, some of the uh, selections you gave us to read, the poetry is wonderful. Yes, yes, Heschel was a poet. And in fact, we read one of his poems, actually, this past Friday night. He has a book of poetry uh, called uh, The Ineffable Name of God. He writes in the very beginning, chapter one, page one of God in Search of Man. To recover the questions, it is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. You know, teaching evolution, Western philosophy has led to you know, science being so valued. He's not, though, going there. It would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion declined not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when, religious, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. And so this you know, really is the message of the Baal Shem Tov as well, going back to the founder of Hasidut. Um, and he is, you know, he's basically taking the message of Hasidut and, and, and amplifying it in, in a modern idiom for us to understand and for us to, who speak English and who are living a modern life to be able to um, restore our, our heart connection to uh, to Judaism and to Jewish life. And so yes, the renewal movement and the lowercase r renewal movements of all of the movements, you know, the whole concepts of, of you know, restoring, whether, whether it's nigunim or you know, ways of, of praying from our hearts, um, praying in English being part of that, you know, really connecting to the meaning of the prayers, all of that comes from the need to make it real, really, and uh, restore the life to a deadened Judaism, um, religion in general, um, which he was finding in the 50s and 60s with these big synagogues being built. You know, we've survived. We're going to build our buildings. We're going to show and so we're going to show. I don't know if it matters. Um, we're going to thank you. We're going to, um, you know, we're going to prove that we're here to stay. We're going to build our edifices and our synagogues and but what was really needed was, I mean, it's, it's impossible to understand, of course, the loss of six million lives, but also the loss of these Hasidic masters in Europe who were teaching and bringing life and renewing um, Judaism for the masses in Europe before, before the Holocaust. So um, I'm going to move on now to this quote. Thank you, Judy, for writing it up. Um, this is from Pirkei Avot. Um, the world stands on three pillars. Al Shlosha Devarim, Haolam Omed. We know the song. Al HaTorah, Al HaAvodah, Al Gimelut Chasadim. On Torah, on Avodah, on Gimelut Chasadim, which is um, acts of loving kindness. Um, Avodah, um, I've heard translated as um, service to God with love. So it's sometimes just translated as prayer, but it's not just worship. It's the ways that we serve God with our hearts and with love. Um, so why am I bringing up this quote? Why do you think? Um, Heschel, I think, um, is truly a model of living these three paths and, and these three um, ways of connecting, which as I mentioned, um, was for him the way to find God. Uh, if you could look on your quotes, compiled quotes by Heschel, God in Search of Man. Does everyone have that one? It's the new set of quotes for tonight. Everyone see where I am? I'm looking in the compiled quotes by Abraham Joshua Heschel, God in Search of Man. Chapter 2, Ways to His Presence. Everyone with me? Right. Hazel, you got it? I can't read it. 
Okay. Is it? Should we make it bigger next time? Bigger. I, I need very bright light. Okay. Um, look, there's two chairs right next to me, and it's quite bright. So if you want to move over, you're welcome. Otherwise, I'll read. We'll, we'll read it out loud. But please feel feel, feel welcome to come. Um, he writes. Does so, or someone want to read um, this section? Ways to his presence. <laughs> there's a light for you, Hazel. <laughs> Do I have a reader? Mary, thanks. How does one seek him? How does one find this world within one's own human existence in response to this world? Ways that lead to the certainty of his presence. Let me stop and just give a little apology that I'm sure Heschel, if he were here, he would say, perhaps, we don't need to use his in this generation. So forgive me for keeping the him and the his, but I'm keeping his words as they are. Um, I think he would have been approved of, of shift, shifting from a his to a hers or its. But go ahead, Mary. There are three starting points of contemplation about talent. Three trails that lead to you. The first is the way of sensing the presence of God in the world, in things. The second is the way of sending his presence Sen in life. Sorry, sensing. Sensing. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be sensing. It wasn't your fault. It was a misprint. The third is the way of sensing his presence in sacred things. There are three ways. These three ways correspond to him, our tradition, our tradition to the main aspects of religious existence, worship, learning, and action. The three are one, and we must go all three ways to reach the one destination. For this is what Israel discovered. The God of nature is the God of history, and the way to know him is to is to do his Sorry for the myth, for the typos. So we, um, we see here that he isn't quoting Pirkei Avot, but he's certainly being influenced by it and organizing his life this way. So for Heschel, um, he writes about his dad that when Pesach would come, his dad would be the Exodus story. He would be the story in the way we like to pedagogically teach our kids to, to really you know, relate to the stories, but he would become a Ben Horin, a new, as if newly liberated from God. Heschel's writing about his dad. Shavuot, he himself received the Torah. Ritual was inseparable from reality. Um, in every event, there is something sacred at stake. And it is for this reason that the approach of the pious man to reality is in reverence. So everything is personal, right? Everything is happening to you. The Exodus story is unfolding in your body, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, in your life story, right? This isn't a chiddush. It's not a new, you know, we're told in the Haggadah to, to um, relate to yourself as if you are coming out of Mitzrayim. They took it seriously, right? He's not creating a new idea here. He's just being truly authentic to what our rabbinics, uh, our, our rabbis of the, of, um, of the Talmud and um, the rabbinic era were asking us to be. So Peter spoke about spiritual absenteeism. It was as if he was um, holding us to account, almost holding us on trial for our spiritual absenteeism and making people uncomfortable with that. He wasn't afraid, like our ancient prophets, to speak the truth to the places where he was. Maybe that's why he let, had to leave HUC. It was hard for him to be in a setting that um, wasn't necessarily going to respond to his words of, of truth to it. the reform movement. He said, don't throw out your rituals as you embrace um, what it is to be a reformed Jew, which is more ethical monotheism, more about ethics, although that to him was essential. And then to the conservative movement, he said, your prayer is dead. <laughs> you know, he said, bring it alive, bring it to life. And, um, you know, there are, there are stories about, about him calling people to task, really. Um, apparently, he wasn't treated very well at JTS, which is hard to imagine and shameful to think about. Um, yeah, he was really treated well at JTS. We entered into 
what he really became an American intellectual thanks to the Union College. Absolutely, all yeah. Of, he became a philosopher, all of that part because he was because he was in a modern academic kind of institution. So. Right. That's true. Yeah. He might have been actually more comfortable at HUC, it's true. Yeah. What struck me was um, everybody has something that is wrong. And he did. And that was to speak to these people that I'm going to invite. Why is this way better than their way? He didn't seem to understand it. And he was so busy and struck me. Let's listen once in a while. Hmm. Okay, that's one perspective on Heschel. Um, I spoke a little bit about his prophetic consciousness and how he wrote about that as in, you know, in his thesis, and we'll next week, or possibly sh also the following week, um, talk about the prophets and um, his theology of this idea of God, the God of pathos, the God who is feeling with us wherever we are. Um, this is the, the Gimelud Chassadim piece. Um, so he spoke to each of them, to prayer, to Torah, um, particularly in heavenly Torah, which we'll study in the third, in the third session, and Gimelud Chasadim through his being, his actions, and his social justice work. So I've, I want us to study in Chavruta for several reasons. One, I think it's a nice pedagogical tool, and another, it's an opportunity to connect with another community member who you might not know so well. And also, it's because his words really deserve the opportunity to be heard and listened to like Torah text, like sacred text, um, the way he studied te text in yeshiva. So how we study text in yeshiva, sort of an introduction to this, is that um, I invite you to read the text slowly, and hopefully there won't be as many typos as that first quote, um, but I had to type all these out. And, <laughs> and you'll... Um, You'll pause and at any sentence, at any moment, um, repeat it, listen to the words, um, ask of your partner what you think of what you just heard. You know, take the time to read them almost meditatively, take in the words like poetry. Um, and uh, this is how we can, we can hear his text. I actually found a chavruta in um, Rabbi Alison Pizer, who is living back in Boston, but we did chavruta on this uh, first third of, of God in Search of Man on the phone, and, and it definitely helps to have a chavruta. Um, so we picked these quotes that you have um, from each of the uh, chapters in the first section of God in Search of Man, which, by the way, is divided into sections not unlike um, the three pillars here. Um, God, revelation, and response is how this uh, philosophy of Judaism is, is, di is divided. Um, yes? I just found this evening before the class, uh, there are shorter quotes too. There's a lot of quote sites, shorter than these, but very thought provoking. Help yourself? <laughs> yes, there are. Um, so we, we spoke earlier about Heschel calling religion to task, um, and we read his opening paragraph. Um, there's just one more little piece to that opening paragraph that you don't have that I want to share, which is the, par the sentence that follows the paragraph that I opened um, with, which says, religion is an answer to man's ultimate questions. And so really, this is so important because what Heschel is doing in this book is saying, it's not about finding answers, curiosity like a scientist has us seeking for answers, but really he sees whatever answers we find should only be windows to a, to a deeper and a, and, a, and, a, and a further place. That we should be seeking, we should be uh, asking constantly, almost like, a, like a, someone who is you know, walking around, we might call them like a maladjusted person who's saying, oh, what is, it, what is the meaning of life all the time? You know? And we say, oh, that person you know, is a little odd. But that's what he wants us to be, right? He wants us to be a little odd. He wants us to be asking these deep questions. What does it mean, the meaning of life? Oh my god, there's a sunset. There's a sunrise. And did you see it this morning? And you know, um, there's, a, there's a midrash of the Israelites crossing the sea. And there are two of them, uh, two of the Israelites 
who, who stop in the middle of the crossing of the sea and they notice the mud and the, and the gook and it's stuck to their feet and the sand and they're at their, you know, they can't see the cross the sea and they can't see the chariots behind them. They're in the middle. There's, you know, a million and a half of these Israelites and they're in the middle and they don't know what's going on. They're just being shoved along and they're just noticing the mud. And they miss the miracle because they're noticing the mud, right? Heschel doesn't want us to miss the miracle of simply being alive. Um, so he's helping us to restore our questions and our questioning um, that has us uh, seek for a deeper reality. The three pillars, Torah, Avodah, Gimilud, Chasadim, uh, our focus in these texts is which of the three would you say? Are we stretching ourselves in terms of Torah, in terms of uh, serving God with love, spirituality, or in terms of Gimilud Chasadim, which is which of the three is are these texts um, teaching us to engage in um, giving us instruction in any of these three, in how to be a a, a, a student of Torah, in how to be um, connected to God and responsive to God, and how to engage in acts of loving kindness. Which of the three would you say? Avodah. Right, so, um, and I think, though, informing also the roots for Gimelud Chasadim as well. Um, on Israel, um, from his book, from uh, Israel, An Echo of Eternity. Throughout history, people have moved from one country to another. They abandoned the memory of their former homes. The Jewish people, however, forced to leave their ancient country, has never forsaken the land of Israel. The Jewish people has never ceased to be passionate about Zion. It has always lived in a dialogue with the Holy Land. Exile from the land was conceived as an interruption, as a prelude to return, never as an abandonment or detachment. What is so precious about the land? What is the magnetic quality of its atmosphere? The land of Israel, biblical chapters hovering everywhere, places like Hebrew letters, waiting to be vocalized, waiting for crowns with which to be adorned. The land is a text. Here you are illiterate unless you remember words of scripture. Wherever you stand, you are at the frontier of biblical moments. Heschel spent, um, visited Israel many times in um, his later years, and, um, and we thank him for this uh, text and um, pray for peace and for safety for all of the people of Israel, for the Palestinian people, and for all people who might be living in fear tonight. May they be held safely in the arms of Shekhinah. And let us say, Amen. Amen.